get closer because we're outdoors. I have to project a lot and we're going to become fast friends today. Thank you so much for coming, first of all. My name is Sergey. I've been studying plants for a very long time and that's kind of what makes me credible to talk about this. I'm not a botanist. I don't claim to be. I've just been doing it a really long time. My family threw me into this is the short version of the story. When I was just 13 years old, my mom decided to hike from Mexico to Canada on the Pacific Crest Trail and we had no business hiking. We'd never hiked more than a day before. <laughs> they took me to like a play it again store, invested what little money we had into really crappy backpacks. And then on April, mid-April in 1998, we had a friend drop us off on the Mexican border to start hiking. As an adult, I realized like <laughs> how crazy this is. But when I was a kid, I was like, oh, I guess everybody's family does this, okay. <laughs> when you hike that far, you obviously can't pack all the food on your back, right? So you have to make arrangements beforehand to pack parcels of food that you ship to yourself. And then every time you pass a little town, you resupply. Again, we had no experience hiking. We sort of started guessing, well, how much food could five hungry hikers really eat in a week? Because the resupply points were about a week apart. And I said five, so it was my mom, my dad, my sister, me, and then my cousin from Russia came to visit us for a year because my uncle wanted um, her to get a full rounded experience, right? So for six months of that year, we took her into the woods <laughs> to give her the American experience. But that's a different story. We get on the trail and within a few short days, we understand that our calculations were off. We just sort of figured out oh, like, how many dates can you really eat? We allotted uh, five dates per person per day, small bottle of olive oil. We were also raw food vegans at the time. So we had a lot to think about. A week into the trip, we started running out of food. So we have two more days left to hike and yet our food is gone. How many people have tried fasting before by a show of hands? Anybody? It's not very fun, right? You always think about food. Now imagine fasting when you're expending 4,000 calories a day, even less fun. So we had a little family meeting. We had to either decide whether we quit the trail and stop doing this or improvise. And my mom's all about improvisation. So, you know, she got some input. We, the kids were like, well, let's quit. And my mom's like, yeah, let's not quit. <laughs> We picked up a little book on wild edibles and we started just learning about different plants. That was one of our little solutions that we came up with. That first week was really scary and slowly we started learning new plants. We used to test all plants on my father because he didn't speak English. And so my mom said that if we lost him, <laughs> it wouldn't be as big of an impact on the family. That's Russian black humor. Long story short, we successfully completed the trail. At a certain point, we were eating 60 to 70% wild edibles by volume. So we were able to stretch the food parcels that we prepackaged and just put a bunch of wild food in them, fill them up. And so from a very early age, I got to see that it's doable, it's realistic. Just like any new skill, it's hard at first, but you perpetually get better. And so today is gonna be about perpetually getting better. One of the things I really hope to accomplish is that through repetition, we're just gonna learn at least three new plants. And that's my goal for today, that each one of you walks away knowing how to identify at least three plants. If you learn 10, great. But let's keep the bar low because my motto is always keep it simple, stupid. Let's do like 10 minutes of theory because I think that's important in the parking lot. And then the second part, we'll go into the park to Jefferson Park right over there. And we're just gonna do hands-on looking at plants, studying them, talking about how you would eat them. I propose that today we're not gonna eat anything. In fact, maybe we can make that agreement simply because I've been here for about a month exploring and it's not the cleanest park. So uh, in, the, in the interest of keeping everybody safe, let's just look at plants, let's talk about them, you know, sniff them, but let's not put them in our mouth. Sound good? Promise, pinky promise? Okay. <laughs> And the reason for that is because outside of, you know, there being plants that you shouldn't eat, human pollutants are actually almost as big of a concern. In fact, maybe more so. Pesticides, herbicides, various chemicals, railroad ties. 
that's something we're going to talk about as well. So why is it important to learn about plants? The main reason is because it enriches our life. It teaches us about our environment. And actually, that I recently learned from Expand Yoga because I started coming here and doing more yoga and I, I know there's a whole list of various benefits like you get more limber and uh, psychologically you rest. But also I realized that yoga teaches you about, about your immediate surroundings, right? So when Liz and Matt tell us to get in Warrior 2, if you've never done Warrior 2 before, now you know you can do Warrior 2. And then they say well, like, well reach around and grab, you know, clasp your hands behind your back and you're like, holy moly, I didn't know I could do that. Now I have that as a skill, it's in my repertoire. So you've just expanded your life because now you know you could squat down like this and if you ever needed to, you could do it, right? In that same sense, plants do the same thing. You go to the park and you're completely novice and it just looks like greenery. You have no idea what it is. Then you start crouching down, you start slowly examining every tiny little morsel, every plant, and your world gets so much bigger. You know, you think the world is huge because there's seven continents and you can fly for 11 hours and end up in Russia or wherever. How much bigger is the world when you start looking at all the little microcosms? So to me, one of the biggest benefits of wild edibles is that it literally enriches your life. It makes it bigger. And how fortuitous that Expand Yoga is sponsoring this. It's like a symbiotic relationship almost. Let's figure out if our worlds need expanding. I made some handouts. Take one, pass it around. I'm going to quiz you. Remember college, anybody? Pop quiz. This right here is a test that I came up with. Um, it's in my book. I have a Wild Edibles book. Shameless plug. I have a couple copies that will be for sale afterwards, but this is a test that's going to help us figure out how much we know about the natural world versus how much we know about the technological modern world. So when everybody gets it, we're going to take it together. I made this in 2012, so some of the na uh, brand names are now becoming obsolete. But let's start from the left, t the top left, and let's just shout it out. What's that first T? Twitter. Twitter. No cheating, by the way. No looking at the bottom. How about the next one? Facebook. Next one. This is where everybody gets stumped. MySpace. MySpace. How about the check mark? Next one. McDonald's, Mercedes, Lacoste, a French tennis brand, right? Now it gets harder. Now let's look at the, the names of the plants. What's A? Oak. Oak. Ooh, I'm impressed. How about the next one? Fur. I like fur. C. How many people say clover? Raise your hand nice and high. How many people say sorrel? It's sorrel, good job. All right, D. Not maple, great. E. Maple seed pod or helicopter, right? F. Douglas fir cone. See how the voices are kind of like getting. Okay, G. I like it. Christmas tree. What type of Christmas tree? It's a fir. Yeah, so fir tree. H? Aspen. Good. And I? That's a maple. Okay, so you guys did better than most, but we could still expand our world a little bit more. The second handout is what I call Sergey's Wild Edibles Cheat Sheet. So it's basically a little printout I made, it's a PDF. And it, on the front it has nine of my favorite plants. And on the back it has some nutritional data and stuff. And so I'm gonna give you the paper version, which you can laminate, or you could use it and love it on this hike. And then if you wanna laminate it later, cause I'm, I laminated this for Liz and Matt, there you go, present. You could go to my website, which is on here, Print this off for free, take it to the print shop, get it laminated, stick it in your car or your backpack, and now you have a little field guide. All right, 
So there's some major benefits to wild edibles and I wanna quickly run through those as well as how to stay safe. Benefit number one, free food. Everybody knows that, that's people kinda, of, that's synonymous with wild edibles. But when you look at it in depth, food costs are continuously rising. Every year they go up three to 5%. When I wrote my book in 2013, they were already expensive, but in 2019, grocery store food bills are even higher than before. Especially if you want to eat healthy, you go to Met Market or you go to a co-op, you can barely get out of there for less than 100 bucks, right? The food that we are going to learn how to harvest and eat today is significantly going to reduce your monthly expenditure on food. So during the summer months, May through November, I can offset easily 40% of my food costs just by harvesting food out of my backyard. You don't even have to go far. Some people think, oh, wild edibles, it's a big pain in the butt. You got to get in your car. You got to take an entire day off of work, go somewhere far. It's literally stuff that's growing all around your house in a neighborhood park, that kind of thing. So wild edibles equal free food. Wild edibles are also healthier for you as well as the planet. So because these plants are wild, they're as nature intended. They have longer root systems that can go down below depleted topsoil and draw out vital minerals. And they also often grow in soils that haven't been depleted. Janice Shawfield, an author that I deeply respect, she also says that wild edibles have stronger immune systems for the area where they grow. So for example, if you live in Tacoma, Washington and you harvest a dandelion that also lives in Tacoma, Washington, you can boost your immune system in the local region. Additionally, when you eat chips or crackers from the store, they come in plastic, triple wrapped in plastic. And the sole purpose of that plastic is to be thrown away. That bothers me every time I do it. Like that's the only use for that thing. It's for cleanliness and to be thrown away. When you eat plants, anything that's left over goes in your compost, turns into soil, it, it reduces waste. So healthier for you and the planet. Benefit number three is the epitome of local food. The average food, the average produce travels roughly about 2,500 miles to get from where it's grown to your plate. A dandelion grows in your backyard. So literally you walk out the back door and that's textbook local food. So less of a carbon footprint. Um, it also diversifies your food. Michael Pollan in his book, In Defense of Food, writes that hundreds of years ago, we used to eat up to 80,000 different species of things. And when I say species, I'm not just talking about like elk and deer, different plants, thousands of different plants, thousands of different nuts and seeds and grains. And then over time, that's reduced, reduced, reduced to roughly, he says 3,000. I actually think it's closer to 300. So we think we live this diverse life where one day we have Italian food, then we have Mexican food, then we have <laughs> Russian food, and really all we're eating is wheat, corn, corn byproducts, rice, sugar, and a few different things. Why do you think it's important to have a diverse diet? Anyone? So diversity is important because all food is comprised of different micronutrients. And the more diversity we get in our diet, the more likely we're to meet all of our recommended daily allowances. We eat some miner's lettuce, it gives us some vitamin C. We eat some kale, it gives us some protein and some other minerals and so on and so forth. And when we eat a very diverse diet, our bodies get enough. And I really think that the first person that coined the phrase, uh, eat a balanced diet, he or she probably like pointed at everything and said, you know, here's some lakes, eat some food from there, some algae. here's the ocean, eat some more seaweed from there, eat some pine nuts from the mountains, eat a diverse balanced diet. So wild edibles will help us expand our food options exponentially. They also prepare us for unfortunate events. Should, ever, should a, a disaster ever happen, you'll actually know what to eat. And um, two other benefits that are worth mentioning is, A, they're gonna help you bond and make memories with your friends and family. Is it really kind of important? Have you ever cooked a meal together? You laugh, you play. Now imagine going outside and harvesting the food and then making the meal. It's, it just kind of adds another layer. And finally, we're all here 
outside. It's becoming more and more of a commodity these days. Um, we're standing, we're getting vitamin D, probably a little bit too much for our liking at the moment, but we're getting vitamin D from the sun. We're breathing in fresh air and we're going to crouch and we're going to dig and that's going to lead to a benefit we call exercise. That's my spiel. I could talk more on this, but I think we should just get at it. Start talking about plants. A uh, little warning. We're going to be very repetitive today and I do that systematically because I want you to remember one of my wild edibles teachers. She actually lives in Issaquah. Her name is Karen Sherwood of Earthwalks Northwest. And that's one of the lessons I took away from her is that if you are repetitive, you strengthen a muscle and then you'll remember it for the rest of your life. So that's how we're going to remember a lot of plants. On that note, let's go. This is the only one I found. I've been coming to this park um, for about a month now, like every couple days. And this is the only wild sweet pea that I found. This is a very controversial plant. So at every wild edibles class I've ever done, somebody's always like, but what about the guy in Into the Wild? He supposedly died from eating sweet peas, a, a version of this plant. The first thing I want to say about that is that story is very inaccurate. You read the book, it says one thing, you watch the movie, it's a completely different story. John Krakauer has been criticized heavily for a lot of his books, but uh, Into the Wild is probably the biggest criticism he's received. There's an author, his name is Samuel Thayer, really awesome dude, a forager I respect. In his book, Nature's Garden, he has a great account of Into the Wild, kind of the true story. Basically what ended up happening is Chris McCandless, he starved to death. That was the official coroner's, like what the coroner determined. But it wasn't a very good story because, you know, this kid going out into the woods and for many, many months not getting enough calories and then starving to death, well, how are you gonna sell that? It's a much more interesting story to sell this sort of scary fable about how plants, he just ate a plant and it killed him. So he supposedly mistook wild sweet pea for wild potato. After he died, both wild sweet peas and wild potatoes were studied extensively and neither of the plants were found to be poisonous. In fact, one of the botanists that studied the plant said that I would eat both plants. So this is a very lovely, tasty plant um, that tastes just like a bean sprout and it grows all over. It develops purple flowers. Sometimes they're yellow. It kind of looks like a, a house pea. It's a vine, right? Today, a lot of what we're going to be doing is I'm going to say, please describe it to me. Please describe it to me. So just take it, take a look, pass it around. Take one, pass it around. So what does it look like? It looks like a sweet pea, right? It looks like a sweet pea. I need more information than that. Rabbit ears for leaves. Yeah, rabbit ears for leaves. Curly cues. Got the tendrils. Ah, I like curly cues and tendrils. So initially when you go out and you look for plants, they all look green and it's hard to differentiate between the two. And this is where we get scared because we're like, oh, well, how do I learn what a sweet pea is versus a sweet potato or whatever? You learn about it in the same way that you learn how to identify a cabbage versus a head of iceberg lettuce. Our brains have folders in our heads and the folders just start storing information. And that information is called a search image. So when you were very young, you probably didn't know the difference between a lemon and an orange, right? Your parents could show you a lemon and an orange. You'd be like, I don't know. They both look round and they both have a skin. And eventually, as you came in contact with lemons and oranges, you started differentiating one and the other. The same thing is going to happen when we talk about plants. So when I say, what does it look like? And somebody says, oh, it has tendrils. That's a very good identifying characteristic that's going to help you recognize the plant. So we're improving our search image. And when you look at a plant long enough, the folder gets really full. And then for the rest of your life, you'll know this is a wild sweet pea. The sweet pea also teaches us something called Mary stems and Mary stems are the growing parts of plants. So when a plant is growing, Mary stem actually comes from the Greek term uh, to divide. So when cells divide and split apart, those are called meristematic parts. So when a plant is young, it's light green and it's very flexible. It's full of 
sugars, it's full of minerals and vitamins, and that's when it's most nutritious and most delicious. As the plant gets taller or longer, the plant cannot support itself if it's all flexible. So it starts developing a solid foundation, very fibrous. So, you know, if you feel this plant, the bottom is very, is, is stiff compared to the top. So this part is meristematic, like the tops of asparagus, for example. You could snap them off, they're very flexible, they're very delicious, but you go down the stem and it's very fibrous, not as delicious. So as foragers, we're gonna wanna look for the tops, the meristematic bits. So on the wild sweet pea, in addition to the flower, the meristematic part is this tender little bit. On we go. There you go. My gift to you. Uh huh. Don't Sergei. 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 Yep. So is the so the whole plant is edible. So the whole plant is edible, so the but is we're going to talk about that. It's it's kind of um it's very objective. While you can eat this part, how hungry are you? How hungry are you? More often than not, I just go through and I'd harvest like a small bowl of those, and that's what I'd throw on a salad. Okay, on we go. My friends get sick of this because like they'll take me out on a hike and I'm like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> there's, there's like five things to talk about right here. So the, the next thing that I want to talk about, which most of us already know is grass. Grass is a plant that most people can already identify, right? There's lots of different varieties of grass and in my book, it's probably the best survival food because everybody knows what grass is. It's hard to miss, miss the, there's some sedges and stuff that kind of look like grass, but more often than not, people know what grass looks like. Grass has all the vitamins and minerals necessary to maintain proper body function, which means that if your car ever gets stuck in the forest and you don't know what else to do, you're really hungry, grass will sustain you. Now we're not cattle, we don't have seven stomachs, it's very hard to digest, but again, if we look for the meristematic bits, the light green parts, they're kind of chewy and, here, hold on. Whenever I do this on camera, it never works, but boom, bam, see? Oh, yeah. So maybe, let's, let's all try this. Let's all come over here and just kind of pull on the top and try and expose this light green part. So grass is kind of a tube, right? And if you pull at just the right place, you can expose, you kind of hear like a little squeak, like a whoop. So when we were hiking on the trail, for example, one thing I would do, I would get ahead of my family because I was walking the fastest. I was a 13 year old boy and had a lot of energy to expend. And I would just walk all day and I'd and throw it away throw it away. So by the end of the day, maybe I had a thousand pieces of grass, you know, and this part is actually quite delicious. Again, it's that kind of meristematic asparagus like part. Um, and then the other thing that accomplishes is because nature is very wise. So when I harvest this, eat this little bit and then throw the grass, I'm planting more grass, the symbiotic relationship. Ann Wigmore, has anybody heard the name Ann Wigmore before? She's the lady that popularized wheatgrass. So she was a Lithuanian woman who had all kinds of um, health problems and the medical industry basically said, we can't help you. And she noticed that her cat was sitting and eating grass every time it was sick and then it would get better. So Ann Wigmore started eating grass and her health problems started going away. And she was the lady that pioneered wheatgrass. So now you go to the store and you pay $4 for a little shot of wheatgrass, it's because of her. But I have a little secret for you you could just juice the grass in your yard and then it save four dollars. How about that? It's the, same quality. it's the same exact quality. There's nothing special about wheatgrass other than it grows the fastest. I used to grow wheatgrass for a health institute and the certain red hard wheat just produces the most grass the quickest. But there's lots of other wild grasses that are more nutritious than that. Now if you're gonna juice grass or blend it in a smoothie, you have to ensure that it hasn't been sprayed with pesticides. So in my own backyard, I know for two years we haven't been spraying it. I would definitely throw that in a green smoothie or juice it. 
but um, you know, I wouldn't go necessarily to a park to do it. The next plant is right over here that I want to talk about. Anybody know what this is? This one? I like where you're going. You, got, you guys are not wrong. So this is called sow thistle. And I already know what this looks like, so why don't you guys pass it around? Sow thistle is in the same family as dandelion, uh, which is the sunflower family. And it's essentially the root of lettuce. So thousands of years ago when lettuce didn't exist, uh, people just ate dandelions and sow thistle. If you've ever chewed on dandelion, you know that it's very bitter. My guess is how we got lettuce from dandelions is people got really sick of that bitter taste. And so they started looking for varieties of dandelion that were less bitter. And once they found that variety, they started waiting for that variety to go to seed, growing those seeds, and then again, choosing selectively the least bitter variety and growing those seeds. And over time, we have romaine lettuce, which almost looks nothing like dandelion, but it's in the same family. So both sow thistle and dandelion are extremely good for our inner organs. The bitterness, kind of the white milky sap, which some people say is not good to eat, that's pure BS, that bitterness is actually really good for cleansing our gallbladder, our pancreas, our kidneys, um, and it also aids digestion. We need bitters to help um, produce saliva and bile in our stomach, and it helps digest food. Unfortunately, now that we eat donuts and cheesecake and all that stuff, bitter just doesn't compete, so we throw the dandelions away or we com complain that they're weeds when in fact we should be eating more of this and throwing the donut away. The easiest way to eat dandelions is to blend them in a green smoothie because when you blend sweet with bitter, the sweetness counteracts the bitter. And then the other thing that's good to do with them is put them in a pesto. So you make pesto with pine nuts, a little Parmesan, basil, just cut out the basil and throw the dandelions in there. And then the sweet and, or sorry, the salty and bitter it just, it tastes delicious. All right, let's keep going. There you go. Thank you. Uh-huh. Do you, um, are you going to talk about oxalates? Or do you Absolutely. Oh, good. Thanks for bringing that up. Sure. Yeah. What was your name? Jenny. Jenny. Nice yeah. to meet you, Jenny. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, Craig. Craig. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how about dandelion roots? I mean, they seem so substantial. Can you... I love it. Yeah, let's talk about it. Okay. So let's address dandelion. I had two questions. Number one, oxalates. There's two ways to think about plants. Number one, there's like the botanist toxicology perspective, which is like, is this plant poisonous or edible based on its chemical buildup? And when you look at that, almost everything is poisonous. So if you read a book about toxicology, you find that things like mint are poisonous. Dandelions have certain alkaloids or oxalates in them that are poisonous in large quantities. And the second perspective is more the Native American perspective where nothing is poisonous. It's all about dosage, certain parts that you can eat, and the time of year that you can eat it. I tend to side more with the Native American perspective because all the research that I've done sort of points in that, in that that is the right direction. So oxalates, all greens have some trace amounts of either alkaloids, oxalates, or anti-nutrients that it's a, a mechanism to preserve the, the plant. So the plant doesn't want you to only eat kale because if we only ate kale, the kale would go extinct. So kale tells you this, it says like, you can eat me, but if you eat 10 buckets of me, you're gonna have some signs of less than perfect health. Maybe a stomach ache, maybe you're gonna get a little hives. Some, some relatively minor issues that we would like to avoid, but nonetheless, it's not gonna kill you. My mom, Victoria Butenko, she came up with the concept of green smoothies and popularized them through her books. And people loved it for 10 years. And then all of this like, don't eat kale and spinach because it has oxalate stuff started coming around um, because people supposedly would get like gallstones at, from that, right? The trouble with that theory is that chocolate, beer, wheat, and a bunch of other stuff have oxalates in them too. And nobody's saying don't eat chocolate, wheat, or beer, at least not at the local brewery, but it's the green smoothie that gives you the gallstones, right? So I have many resources um, online about this subject in particular. I actually have a YouTube video. I'm on YouTube prevalently and 
And basically, it's a non-issue if you eat a diverse diet. If you were to eat buckets of kale every single day, again, you might run into some problems. If you rotate your greens, if you rotate the food that you eat, it's not an issue because those oxalates will get eradicated through your kidneys and liver, so it's not a big deal. Now, if you were to eat seasonally, this would be even less of an issue because in the springtime, you're gonna eat lots of dandelion, then dandelions go away, you're gonna eat something else. But because we've, quote unquote, improved life, where now we have kale all year round at the grocery store, you know, it's, it's more of an issue. The second question was, do you eat um, things cooked? Yeah, wild edibles, you're gonna cram them in your diet every which way. You can throw them in salads, and I'll spotlight some of the things that you could do with salads. You know, put these in smoothies, juice them. You can also put them on your pizzas and saute them up, throw them in soups. Get them into your diet as best as you can because these are uh, superfoods. And these are supplements that you don't have to pay for. One of my rants on supplements is that it's, it's kind of controversial. Some people don't like that I say this, but I've never taken supplements. I've tried many times, but I've found that there's, there's no effect. Um, supplements first are sold on a fear-based scheme. The nutrients that are around is not enough. If you just eat organic food, you'll never be healthy. That's kind of how that supplement story starts. And then you're like, oh no, man, even if I shop at a, a Whole Foods, and buy the best ingredients that I can buy, I still don't get enough, that's scary. Maybe I should get your supplement. You take the best supplement, and best, most expensive supplement, you twirl it around and read on the ingredients list, and what is it made of? Corn. If, yeah, most of the time it's like rice protein with some of the good stuff, like 90% rice, 10% everything else. But if it's a really high quality supplement, it's made out of fresh organic produce. So please explain to me how if lettuce doesn't have enough of what I need, but the supplement that I'm buying from you is made from lettuce, like how does that make sense? Okay, let's talk about this plant right here. Everybody grab one. When we harvest plants, I encourage everybody to engage all of their senses. We have five senses because each one of those is a different form of communication. Each one of those senses is meant to help keep us safe. So sometimes when people get poisoned from eating stuff they're not supposed to, it's because they just like, and they only engage one sense. Well, that's four other tests that you failed to do. And the other thing on that that I wanna say is that Wild plants are not dangerous. The only way that you would get poisoned is if you're just going through the woods and you just start eating stuff before you identify what they are, right? There's no like bad dandelion sitting in an alley waiting for you to walk down that alley so they can jump down your throat. So number one, if you can resist the temptation to just eat foreign foods, you'll always be safe. Then we engage our senses. So we, we put all plants through five different tests. First, what does it look like? So what does this look like? Chamomile. Kind of like chamomile. I like it. You're a yeah, professional. It smells, like it. it smells like chamomile. So it looks like chamomile. So already it's telling us, hey, this looks like a familiar food that I'm accustomed to eating, right? That's a very good point. I'm so glad you brought that up. The next test is how, what does it feel like? It's soft. It's soft. I can conceivably eat this because it feels soft. If I were to try and eat that telephone pole, maybe my eyes would get confused. I don't think they would, but if, they, if my eyes got confused, I'd feel it, and my hands would tell me what my eyes missed. This is really hard. I'd break my teeth if I would eat it, right? This little plant has now passed the looking test and the feeling test. Now, what does it smell like? If you smash the flower, If you smash the flower, it smells like pineapple. And I'm so glad you bring this up because this is called pineapple weed. And it's a wild chamomile. Oh, it does. So look at that. This is how we learn about plants. So it looks like chamomile. Well, lots of plants look like chamomile. We feel it. It feels soft. 
we smell it. Oh, wow, it smells like pineapple. So now we just learned, looks like chamomile, smells like pineapple. Those are really good identifying characteristics. So we have two more senses. What does it sound like? In Native American lore, you would actually talk to the plant and it would talk to you, which is a quality that I've lost. But I interpret that sense to, to be like, what does the environment sound like? I hear somebody mowing. Is, there, is, is somebody spraying chemicals? Is there a big roadway nearby? Is there anything, is there any sound that might jeopardize the edibility of this plant? And then the very last um, test is what does it taste like? And so you're not just gonna grab a bunch of it at the, at the beginning and just put it in your mouth and go, I hope it tastes good. You're gonna approach it cautiously and you're gonna just eat a little bit and then you're gonna wait. And then if you do this you know, cautiously and over time, you'll understand, oh, chamomile, wild, wild chamomile, AKA pineapple weed. If you dry this, it makes a really good tea. Chamomile has calming properties. If you have any sort of allergic stuff going on because of the seasons or food allergies, it'll soothe those. And it also helps to improve sleep. So what I would do, I would actually throw these flowers and tender leaves into salad. I would saute them, put them on an omelet, if you will, throw them in soups, or just dry the leaves and make a tea out of them. So if you did do that, if you put it on a salad, uh -huh. how many of these would you do with so, that being? Okay, so if it was my very first time eating yes. this plant, yes. I would just put like a handful on it, right? And then just see what happens. A handful. a handful is fine. A lot of people get nervous about wild edibles because they think, oh, if I misidentify it, the consequences are huge. But the, the consequences most of the time are relatively insignificant. Like you might get a little bit of a stomach upset. That being said, we want to eliminate as many variables and consequences as possible. So we approach new food cautiously and then we eliminate those variables. And in fact, actually on that sheet that I gave you, I have uh, Sergey's rules for foraging, and it's three simple rules. Number one, don't eat something if you don't know what it is. Kind of common sense. A lot of people actually disregard that, surprisingly. I get emails all the time. People say, my kids and I went out and we harvested this plant. Can you tell us what it is? We ate a bunch of it. Like, <laughs> So I actually made a rap song that's on YouTube called Don't Eat Something If You Don't Know What It Is that plays around with um, how silly that can be. The second rule is eat new foods in small amounts. So maybe when you're young, everything is foreign to you and your parents are very cautious. Like what is, what happens when he eats sweet potatoes? Eh, he's good. What happens when he eats um, lettuce? Oh, he's fine. And then maybe you get to peanuts and the, your parents figure out pretty quickly, ooh, he's not, peanuts don't do so well for him. So you learn at a young age what you're allergic to and what you're not allergic to. Well, in the interest of staying safe, that's essentially what you're doing when you're playing around with new plants. So you're gonna approach all new plants as though you're potentially allergic to them. So even though Sergey says pineapple weed is 100% edible, the first time you eat pineapple weed, you're just gonna eat a little bit. And then rule number three is you don't mix plants. Um, because if I made a salad with 15 new wild edibles and then I had an allergic reaction, it'd be very hard to weed out what caused it, right? All right, let's keep going. So real quick, what do you guys see right now when you look at this park? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Grass, dandelions, the dogs, walking. dogs walking. I like all those things because look, you already just altered your world a little bit. You know, maybe before this started, you would have just seen a park. Now I already heard two different edibles, grass and dandelions. And three, I love that you said dogs walking because that's a really good thing to consider. <laughs> hey, there's animals, it's a high trafficked area. Good job. One more thing about dandelions. These things are really edible and they're delicious. The little flowers. So. When you're at home, I invite you to, this is your homework. Just take one of these flowers and plop it in your mouth, chew it up. You'll notice that it's very sweet. Kind of has a pleasant green kale-like taste. These things concentrate vitamin D. And guess what, in areas where we lack it many months out of the year, 
this is a really good thing to put in your diet. Now, how do you eat it? Flour fritters. You can fry them up in a little bit of um, oil and batter. Great. You can also take these and stick them in honey and the honey will just concentrate, preserve them, right? So you make like a dandelion infused jam. You can throw them on salads raw. You can throw them in soups. Uh, one thing I like to do sometimes is actually take the petals out, out of it, put them in an ice cube tray, fill it with water, freeze them. Now you have flour, petaled, infused ice. And in a summery drink, it looks beautiful. Make sense? Okay, we're gonna go into the shade over there, kind of get a little reprieve from the sun and talk about some plants. Is it necessary to wash that? Oh, yeah, is it necessary to wash that? Absolutely, you wanna wash stuff. Okay. Yeah. Just asking. I like it. Sound like throw it right? Okay, there's been a, a few follow-ups about dandelion. One is about the, the root and one about the leaves. Let's see if we can't get both here. So we'll do some digging. And careful, there's blackberries. Okay, so. Number one, if you can find a dandelion, actually I'd love everybody to grab a leaf of dandelion if you can. Okay, everybody has a dandelion leaf, right? Here's a test to identify a true dandelion. You're gonna flip it over and you're gonna run your finger along the main vein. Tell me what you feel. Smooth. smooth. Fuzz? Uh-oh, let's see. No, it should be smooth. No, so, so the leaves are a little fuzzy, but the vein of a dandelion is smooth. That's a true dandelion. So that's one great identifying characteristic. So this one with fuzz on it is not. So the one with fuzz on it is not a dandelion. So there's lots of different varieties of dandelions. Like I already mentioned, they're in the sunflower family. The sunflower family is the largest family of plants. There's nearly 24,000 varieties. Um, and a lot of those are edible. I don't wanna speak in absolutes. I don't wanna say all of them are edible because some people might be allergic to dandelion, for example, and so for them, they're not edible, but it's a very good family to get accustomed with, uh, accustomed to because you could potentially expand your food choices 24,000 different ways, right? And I believe there's over 300 varieties of dandelions and all of them are edible. You can eat the leaves in smoothies and soups, salads. You can eat the flowers, you can eat the stems, and you can also eat the roots, um, but generally, I don't eat the roots because when you harvest the roots, it kills the plant. So in my book, I have a chapter called uh, Respect the Roots. With something like a dandelion, it's not a big issue because dandelions are extremely resilient. So if you see 100 dandelions growing, you can eat 99 of them and they'll be fine. But with other plants like wild ginger, for example, it's really, really sensitive. So if you start harvesting roots, you're going to wipe out that population and then it won't grow there. So in an effort to be more ecological, I suppose, and responsible, I often stay away from the roots and just harvest the greens and the fruits because I feel like that's nature's gift to us. And I also am kind of lazy sometimes. I feel like it's a lot easier to harvest some greens than some roots. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's kind of where I stand on roots. If you were to eat them, uh, you could bake them in the same way that you'd bake like sweet potatoes or potatoes. In the South, they actually make a coffee substitute out of dandelion roots and chicory roots. It does not have caffeine, so you get the taste of coffee, but you don't get the, the stimulant. Um, what else can I tell you? Is there any other questions about roots? Do you worry about the soil that they're growing in? So, like in this park, would you eat the roots? In this park, I probably would not eat the roots because I haven't run, done my due diligence. I haven't called the parks service to figure out what they spray or don't spray. Mm -hmm. But in my yard, I would eat the roots, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we're standing under a tree. Who knows what kind of tree this is? Horse chestnut. Horse chestnut. So horse chestnuts are not traditionally considered edible, but since we're here, I just want to point out, everybody grab a chestnut. So they look very similar to 
the chestnuts that we eat around Christmas time. The one major difference between those and horse chestnuts is that the edible ones have a, a deep point on one side. And these ones are kind of round with no point. If you ever want to identify a true chestnut, it's going to look just like this, but on the butt of it is going to have a sharp point. So why are some edible? Why are not some not? It's kind of an alkaloid issue. We talked about oxalates. Horse chestnuts just concentrate more tannins. So they're very bitter. They hurt our stomach. They're not considered edible. So you would not eat these. But the other horse, or the other chestnuts with the point, they have less tannins. Thus, they are more edible. And again, something like this, Native Americans might not consider poisonous because there are ways of extracting tannins from acorns and chestnuts, but they're very labor intensive. And like I said, I'm a little bit lazy. I like to kind of throw something in my blender and get going. So I can do it, but I generally don't. Make sense? Again, we have some wild grasses. Now you can see there's two different varieties at least. So you have kind of more of like a wild oat type looking grass, which has seeds. And then you have like a big you have another variety of grass, which probably from a foraging standpoint is going to be a, a much better thing to, to spend your time harvesting because look how thick it is versus this. Then you pull on the top, there's more meristematic bits to eat versus this. So one thing to think about, you know, if you're harvesting food, you're going to go for something that gives you more reward, right? And it'd be the thicker grass. The other thing worth pointing out right here is blackberries. So blackberries, obviously the berries are edible, but the leaves on blackberries are also edible. And in fact, they're really good for things like dysentery, for fungus stuff. They have antibacterial properties. If you're ever traveling, for example, and you run into stomach issues, you can eat charcoal, but you can also eat blackberries, raspberries, thimbleberries. Those leaves will help settle your stomach. How would you eat them? So how would you eat them? Good question. So right here, check it out. Another lesson in Mary stems. So everybody try and, and kind of get close. And you can see that some, as the plant matures, the thorns get really stiff and hard. But then if you look at the top part, you see that it's lighter green. That's the meristematic part of the blackberry. And now very carefully just feel the thorns and notice how they're not quite developed yet. So you can go through with a little knife and peel the thorns and eat the little stems of the blackberry. And that's kind of more like your little wild asparagus. Or you can take the young leaves, which are pretty much thornless, use those in a salad. Or if you boil them down, the thorns become completely not an issue. They just go away. The best way that I've found to use them is you just dry these leaves, crush them up, throw them in tea, and then uh, take a little bit with you when you go travel internationally. And now you know that this stuff will help settle your stomach. Now, the one caution about your blackberries and raspberries is you don't want to eat the leaves when they're wilting. So you want to eat them fresh or you want to fully dry them because in the wilting process, they start releasing like more alkaloids or something. And it, it can sometimes have the opposite effect. But if you eat them fresh, like within an hour of harvesting or fully dry, completely no problem. All blackberries and raspberries are in the rose family. Roses, apples, blackberries are in the same family. And a lot of those relatives are edible and delicious. By the way, wild roses are delicious in salads, just the petals themselves. And, um, you know, since in Washington you have a lot of them and they grow like weeds, eat the weeds. Right behind you, there's another plant I want to talk about. It's called common mallow. That's it, yeah. Here's. We'll sacrifice this root for the group. Okay, I want to hear it. What does it look like? Geranium, good. What else? I'll tell you a little a story. So I, I went to here in Tacoma, actually, we're really lucky because 
two really good foragers live within driving range. Uh, one of my teachers, her name is Karen Sherwood. She lives in Issaquah. And every Memorial Day holiday, she hosts a three-day retreat outside of Yakima, where all you do all day long is you harvest plants and then you make food. And you harvest plants and you make food. Really good thing to look up. Her company is called Earthwalks Northwest. And then another guy does the same thing out of Portland. His name is John Kalis. He's another awesome dude. So when I went to my first workshop with Karen, she said, Sergey, here's a big bowl. Go get a bunch of clovers. Put it in your salad. We're going to put it in everybody's salad. So go out with the bowl and I don't collect anything. I can't find a single clover to save my life. And I come back deflated. And I'm like, Karen, there's no clover. She says, take this bowl, go back to the field, squat, crawl if you have to, but bring it back full of clovers. So I go back to the exact same field where I was. It was kind of on a farm property and I squat and I start looking closely. It was a, an entire field of clover. I just wasn't looking close enough. So there I learned the importance of describing a plant. And when I say, what does it look like? I'm not looking for anything specific. I mean, I am because I know what it looks like, but I'm looking for keywords to hear like, how will you remember this plant? So when I say, what does it look like? What I want to hear from you is, how will you remember this plant? Let's try it again. What does it look like? like a doily. A doily. I like it. Uh huh. What else? It's soft. It's soft. I love that. Very good. So, look at all these things. It looks like a geranium, and a doily. It's got a soft, fuzzy flower, and a rough stem. Great characteristics. Yes, it has lots of stems instead of main ones. Now, if you look at how it's growing on the ground, what can you tell me? Do you think it's a creeping plant or do you think it's going to grow straight up? Very good identifying characteristic. So this plant is called mallow, common mallow or malva. And it's actually a close relative of okra. So when you see this plant, this is one of the best eats that you can forage. And it's a very common weed. It likes dry soils. So you'll generally find it growing in the sun. Every part is edible, though the flowers or the, the leaves, I'm sorry, are the most delicious. And if you were to eat them, they taste just like okra. They have like a gelatinous quality to them. So what can you do with that? You could put it in a gumbo. You can make an okra gumbo. Great in soups. Uh, sometimes when you make a smoothie and it starts to separate, it kind of looks unappetizing. You throw a little common mallow in it and it just makes, it binds it better. In fact, um, in the olden days, they used to use this plant in the cheese making process where they would use it as a binding agent. It also has little flowers and the flowers kind of look like, um, they almost look like the little bluebells that grow everywhere. And these flowers are delicious in salads. If you ever go to a potluck and you bring a salad and sprinkle a handful on top of that, people will go bananas. <laughs> and this grows in your backyard. Any questions about common mallow? How do you spell that? M-A-L-L-O-W. Okay. There's a guy, uh, his name is David Wolf. He's kind of a health nut guy. He's been all over social media for many years. Um, but when I met the guy, it, right before we started hiking the trail, actually, he introduced me to this plant. And what we would do is we'd just take big leaves of mallow, roll avocado in them, and sprinkle them with lemon juice. It was a really delicious snack, actually. Wow. On we go. Oh, we didn't go very far. <laughs> what is this plant right here? <laughs> it's a bottle. Somebody said, said it. Yeah. Dead nettle. Ooh, that sounds really scary. Everybody grab one and let's study it. Oh, perfect. I might sit here for a while. There's some over there too. This is called purple dead nettle and it has a very ominous name. It's actually not poisonous at all. This is a wild mint. It doesn't smell like mint. So we're engaging all our senses. Everybody smell it. Kind of has like a musky smell. The reason it's called 
purple dead nettle is because it kind of looks similar to stinging nettles. And because of that, people don't like the way that nettles itches. I think I guess that's where it got the name. All mints have a square stem. So just like the dandelion has a smooth stem, all mints have a square stem. The mint family is full of edible plants. It's a good thing to know. How would you use this? I would just basically take that much of it and throw it in anything. Whether that, that is a, a salad, this, you know, it's a little bit fuzzy, so I probably wouldn't eat this raw, but um, I mean, I, I could eat it raw, but because it's a little bit fuzzy, I wouldn't enjoy it as much. So let's come up with some ways that you would eat this. Anybody? Saute. I like the tea idea, but I mean, let's, let's get creative here. What else could you do with this? Don't worry, if you, if you say something I don't like, I'll tell you. Pizza. Anybody else? Tempura. Tempura, yeah, I like it. Those are all great. Can you eat the stem? You can eat the stem. And all mints, again, help to calm the system. So if you have any sort of seasonal allergies or um, you ate something and it, it doesn't agree with your belly, eating a little bit of mint will help to soothe it. So that's a really good thing to know. So maybe if you're going traveling internationally, if you want to go above and beyond, you take some purple dead nettle and you dry the leaves and you mix it with some blackberries or raspberries and you dry the leaves and you kind of make yourself a little bag of, of greens, which hopefully <laughs> customs won't <laughs> sniff you for. I usually put it in like a little supplement bottle. I think that's what supplements are good. They have like a nice little thing and, and then I just make a tea out of them abroad. Okay, who remembers the quiz that I gave them? Everybody grab some of these. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> these are little baby helicopters. And helicopters identify a plant or a tree. And what's that tree? Oh, maple. maple, very good. So this, for, this forest, this park has lots of different types of trees in it. And trees are a class of foods that I would sort of consider as like a survival food because a lot of the common trees that we're used to encountering have edible parts and maple is certainly one of them. They're kind of like in that grass area where it's not the best meal that you'll ever have, but they are edible. So in dire circumstances, you could eat these tiny little maple seeds and they'll give you some nutrition. You can also see how some of these leaves are very tender and actually it's maple, so they're very sticky. Grab a leaf, feel a leaf. And that stickiness is actually maple syrup, right? The lifeblood of a maple tree is a clear fluid that's like maple juice. And then people will go in here and tap the tree and get a big bucket full of this clear maple juice, maple blood, and then they'll boil it down for about 30 hours. I believe it's 30 hours, it might even be longer. And eventually it'll concentrate and turn into maple syrup. And just like you can do that with maple, you could also do it with birch. You could do it with Aspen. Um, and so like uh, in Europe during World War II when there was food shortages, a lot of people in Russia and Germany and France, they actually went and they would eat like little buds of maples, the seed pods, the leaves, and they would cook them in their soups. Just the, it's pure nutrition. So it's really good to know about that. Hey, you know, this is a maple, that's a beech that's a birch and all, all parts of those things are edible. You can actually, eat, there's a layer inside the bark called the cambium layer, the inner layer. It makes for good eating. Um, that would be in the same category as roots though. You wanna know exactly what you're doing so as not to kill the tree. Over here. Okay, if I was a wild edible superhero and I had a tool belt, on my tool belt I would certainly include this plant. So grab a leaf and pass it around. Uh, 
I want to see if I can't find the other. There's two varieties of this plant. Here, grab a leaf, pass it around. This is called plantain. And it has no relation to the banana. This is a very fun plant. Um, this plant has a lot of amino acids in it, which is also known like as protein, a lot of plant-based protein. The reason I would have this on my belt as a superhero is because this plant can literally save your life. So plantain has this miraculous quality to draw poison out of your system topically. So for example, a couple years ago, I was um, showing off in front of some friends and I was doing a handstand. I fell in the grass and I got stung on my back by numerous bees. And I'm not allergic, so it wasn't a big deal. But if you are, it could have been a really big deal, right? So it started to hurt, it was uncomfortable, and I knew what to do. I ran around and I found this plant. I chewed it up, made a poultice, spit it into my friend's hand, and I said, can you please rub it on my back? Within 10 minutes, the pain is gone. So if you ever get stung by an ant, a bee, a spider, if you step on a rusty piece of metal and you can't get to the hospital right away, this plant will actually draw toxins out of your skin. Uh, Janice Shawfield, an author that wrote a book called Discovering Wild Plants, she talks about how her dad, I guess he was accident prone, and so one time he treated a gunshot wound with this stuff, nice. and another time he had blood poisoning, which is a very serious thing, and he was able to not die basically by using applying plantain to the wound. Have you ever heard of psyllium husk? Yes. What is psyllium husk? It's like a, oh, here you go. Liz found it. This is a, the other variety of plantain. Good job, Liz. So this is lance leaf plantain. This is broad leaf plantain. So psyllium husk is a supplement type food that helps digestion. It's like natural vegan gelatin, right? Where does psyllium husk come from? Plantain. It's a wild crafted food. So a plantain will develop these seed pods that look very similar to baby corn. It's a little too early for it right now, but they'll develop these massive long stalks that can have up to 20,000 seeds on them. And those little stalks are delicious when you boil them. They taste just like baby corn. That's number one. When those 20,000 seeds all develop husks around them, people somehow, somehow have sh shake the husk away, and that's what psyllium husk is. So, so what are some of the key identifying characteristics of plantain? It's fibrous at the bottom. Very good. And the color at the bottom. Yeah. I love it. Okay, so the top of the leaf is a darker green than the bottom of the leaf. Can everybody see that? There's something very obvious. The veins grow out long. Yes. So the veins grow out really long. Do you see that? They're very easy to distinguish. I think that you like greens don't you <laughs> I love greens. so here check this out here's one of my own personal identifying characteristics so if you take the stem stem of plantain and you carefully crush it look at this so try that if you can find plantain near you see if you can expose some of the threads oh here i'll come over here so yeah, here, play around with that. I'm gonna show these folks. Okay, so yeah, check it out. So if you just see how they have these lateral veins, if you just pull really carefully, it starts exposing threads. Like, like it's been sewn, very good. So now you know what plantain is like, right? And so if you're ever in doubt, like is that plantain? Um, you're gonna say, oh, veins that you can easily see long seed, seed pods and if you pull on the stock it's going to reveal threads plantain absolutely you can eat the leaves um, they're pretty rich in chlorophyll which is not a bad thing but they do taste strong this would be like an advanced green so put it in a soup throw it on a pizza i literally cram wild edibles into everything when i was researching my book i'm sitting there and i'm just like what is this plant good for i have nutritional data in there. I kid you not, the USDA, there's a website called um, nutritionaldata.com and it's basically uh, USDA information from the 60s when the government just 
had a bunch of money they were throwing at figuring out what's, you know, what food is rich in. And surprisingly, they have quite a few wild edibles on there. So I'm sitting there compiling these charts and I'm thinking like, well, what is plantain good for? And it's literally good for everything. I kid you not, it's not an exaggeration. What is dandelion good for? It's literally good for everything. It's got tons of vitamins and minerals. It's got amino acids, antioxidants. So at that point I was like, it's kind of silly to remember exact things because it's literally good for everything. Okay, see this plant with the purple flowers? I'll meet you right by it. Oop. Look how pretty this is. I don't even know what kind of plant this is, but I know that it's a mustard. And the reason I know that it's a mustard is because mustards are in the brassica family, which is nearly 2000 different plants. And it includes broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and all mustards smell like mustard. So sometimes we rely too heavily on our eyes and we can just be like, oh, I don't really know what this is. I, I don't know what it looks like. But then you come over here, you grab a leaf, you crush it up. And if it's a mustard, it should start smelling like mustard. So I invite you to come over here and start and do this with me. This one's pretty faint. There's other characteristics, but the leaves on this are pretty faint smelling. Can anybody get a little hint of mustard? Look at how big this leaf is. Does anybody, so did we get a little hint of mustard? If not, there's another mustard over here that you'll definitely smell it. Look how big this leaf is. You can literally wrap, make little wraps in this. Uh, one thing I like to do, I call it gorilla wraps. Ooh, ooh. No, just kidding. Um, you take a banana and you wrap it in a green leaf. It could be a collard leaf, it could be a kale leaf, it could be a wild mustard leaf. And what you'll find is that the greens will complement the fruit and the fruit will complement the greens. Uh, you could also make a nice dolma out of this. You could um, opt, you know, if you say you like low calorie diets, here's a perfect little tortilla. Also it has these beautiful flowers. All mustards have four petals. They can be different colors, yellow, white, purple, pink. And come over here and grab, grab one of these. All mustards also have six stamen. Stamen are those tiny little antennae that are in the flower. So they have four petals, six stamen, Four of those are going to be long and two will be short. And then this one in particular has its own version of the seed pod, which is kind of like a little pea almost. And you can eat those too. They kind of have a spicy peppery taste. So if, if I was picking this plant for food, I'd be like, look, big leaves. I'm going to do something with those. Maybe I'll cut them into a salad. But since they're big, I'd probably make a wrap out of this. This I'd probably throw on top of the salad because they're nice peppery. They would enrich it, make it look beautiful. And then the seed pods would just add a little bit of crunch. They'd be like a wild uh, sweet pea. John Kalis, who has a book called Wild Edibles from Dirt to Plate, he says that wild mustards through his research are the most nutritious green on the planet. And so it's a really good one to know about. Now let's go this way because I want to find, I want to actually demonstrate how different two mustards can look and yet they still smell like mustard. Check out this plant. If you touch it, it starts shooting seeds. Whoa. Yes. Whoa. I know. I thought they were mad at me when I Come on, you guys. This is a bitter crest, which is a mustard, yeah. One of the things I've been criticized for in my book is that I don't have regions for where the plants grow. And the reason I did that is because plants, just like humans and animals, they love to travel. And they have different mechanisms for doing this. Hello. <laughs> this plant, it propagates when you touch it, it literally shoots out feet away. That's the plant saying, I'm going to pr produce a lot of offspring. <laughs> Maybe let's go over there so the dog settles down. So plants love to travel and um, in the natural world, they get pretty far. And I think the regional thing, that, that's just something we humans have made up for convenience. Um, but nature isn't here for our convenience. Let's take one of this. And we're going to crush it up and see if it smells like mustard. Yep, smells like mustard. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. 
Who gets mustard? Raise your hand if you get mustard. You get like a musty smell. Yeah. But it's a very distinct, like so, not like the yellow mustard that comes in a can, but like arugula mustard. Think that. You get it? So this is called bittercress, and it's a mustard relative. Who knows what kind of tree this is? It looks very similar to an alder. In fact, if you just look at the leaves, they kind of look like alder leaves. Mm -hmm. This is actually a beech tree. And one of the tall tales of a beech is that it has elephant-like skin. So that's a great identifying characteristic. The other thing is right beneath your feet. Let's see if we can figure it out. So give yourself a little squat and see if you can't find some nuts. Beech nuts. Beech nuts. So this is how this works. So hey, I think that's an alder. And then you kind of look at your surroundings and you start engaging your other senses and you find beech nuts. And right now there's no nuts in it. Why is that? Oh yeah, there you go. We found some nuts. So this is a beech nut right here. So in nature, uh, we also compete with other critters and squirrels are much better at harvesting nuts than we are because they've had lots more practice. And it's also not nut season. So um, right now would be, if we lived seasonally, right now would be our time to eat mustards and kale and dandelions and grass. And then later on in the season, we would be eating more nuts, things like beech nuts. So these are essentially similar to acorns. Uh, the native tribes used to make meal out of them and make breads and cookies and all kinds of little biscuits out of them. Like I said, there's not a whole lot to talk about because these are last year's nuts and there's, it's not great, but it is a good food source. They're edible, require a little bit more food prep than some of the greens again, because they have tannins in them and tannins come off as extremely bitter. So traditionally you would either soak them or boil them in water. Native Americans would actually take a wicker basket put a bunch of nuts in there like acorns and just stick that basket in the stream. And it was really ingenious because it didn't, there wasn't any extra work for them, but the water that was perpetually changing would wash the tannins out. And then they would take those nuts after 24, 48 hours, grind them, make a flour, and then make food out of it. So looks like an alder, has elephant-like skin. And then when you get close and personal, you see that it has little nuts. And now we just identified beech. This is something that all gardeners should know. The little white stuff, yep. Yeah. Is that, meadow that might be one common name for it. I know this as chickweed. So everybody grab yourself a chickweed. This is the macro part of the wild edible walk. Yes, wow. Chickweed is like a wild lettuce. Uh, it's a very common herb. It's a very common weed in gardens. So when you go and you plant a garden, a lot of weeds start growing there. And if you weed them out before they really get big, before you can identify what they are, uh, you miss out on a, a bunch of free food. One of my friends in Missoula runs a garden. He just runs a big farm. A lot of the stuff that grows in between the rows of corn or onion or whatever is things like chickweed. And they're actually more nutritious than the fruit, food that's being grown. We just forget to look for them. So Kylie, my girlfriend, can attest to this. We're planting our garden right now and she really desperately wants to weed, and I'm like, Don't do it. save that, <laughs> it's really good food. This is a vitamin C powerhouse. So this is like nature's emergency. I believe a cup of this has over 90 milligrams of vitamin C, so that's antioxidant rich. It's got properties that will help fight off cancer. You're gonna be less likely to ever develop cancer if you eat this stuff. And it tastes awesome. It's like a really mild lettuce. Let's examine the flowers first. Tell me what they look like. How many petals does it have? Can, can any, is anybody's vision good enough to count the petals? So very good. It looks like 10 petals, but it's actually only five. But the petals are very deeply cleft. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, oh yeah, they're like double petals. See what I mean? So it's like a double petal. The other thing that chickweed has, this is very hard to explain, but you can see it, is it has a mohawk hairline on one side of the stem that alternates in between leaves. So like if this is a section and then that's a section and below that leaf is another section, there's a hairline and it'll jump to opposite sides of the stem. Oh, funny. Hmm. Cool. 
and it's a, a plant that likes shade. Look, it's growing under a tree. That's telling us it's communicating more information to us. It likes shade, so this uh, beech is doing that for it. And it likes to spread on grass. This is like a, a wild sprout, super good raw in sandwiches, wraps. You know, if you ever go to the deli and get a sandwich, it's, if it's your guilty pleasure, just make sure if you throw some chickweed on it. There's a lot of Christmas like trees in this world, right? It can be very difficult to tell them apart. I'm gonna give you a little trick right here and now. Pine needles are long, generally long. Spruce needles kind of almost look like mint stems. They have four corners, so you can spin them in between your fingers, right? If you can spin it, it's probably a spruce. If you can't spin it, it'll be flat. It's a fir. So now you just learned all about conifers. Long needles, pine. Short needles that kind of look like pipe cleaners at first glance could either be spruce or fir, and then you do the test. It spins, it's a spruce. It doesn't spin, it's a fir. So this is your test over here. Come over here. We're gonna do this at least three times while we're in the park. Grab a needle. I know it's kind of cheating because that pro branch probably fell off this tree, but what kind of tree is this? This is a party trick right here. Next time you're hiking with your friends, just say, guess what? This is spruce. All evergreens have edible properties. They actually also concentrate vitamin C. Uh, they're really good for respiratory stuff. So if you have any sort of cough or phlegm going on, uh, the best thing to do for that is to make a tea from the needles. So you basically get a pot, throw a bunch of needles in there, and then heat it up, boil it for like two minutes, then let it cool so that it's drinkable, and pour yourself a nice little glass of pine needle tea. Kind of has a Christmassy vibe to it, but it has a really nice lemony characteristic. And it's a great thing to do when you're camping. Like if you want to engage your kids or your friends or your partners, next time you go camping, this is Sergey's homework number two, just harvest some either spruce or pine or fir and make some trail side tea for yourself. The, you can eat the spruce tips and, and you actually beat me to the punch. There's a tree that has them, but that's, um, that's, I'm glad that you pointed that out. Uh, the only caution on evergreens is if you're pregnant or nursing, you, you want to avoid them because there's something that um, small kids and fetuses don't like. So if you're pregnant, avoid that. Otherwise, they're completely edible and beneficial. We have a nice little birch here. And again, this is kind of like a, a survival food in my opinion. So like all of the little, if, if I was starving to death, I would come over here and I'd eat some of the tender leaves. These buds are really good, food source. Um, this is a little bit past its prime, but these little guys, when they're green, like baby corn, you can boil it. Uh, and so you can imagine if you got maybe a gallon of these, that would be a pretty substantial food source. Uh, again, the intercambian layer, the bark of the tree is edible, but if you don't do it right, you can kill the tree. So I generally avoid that, but birches are edible. This is probably the most pathetic miner's lettuce specimen I've ever seen, but because it's in the park, I figured we'd talk about it. Oh, I'll let you take a picture. Look at how unique that looks. So it's a, this is called a basil rosette, this growth pattern where it's, mustards do this too. They kind of spread out. It's not just one stalk and um, leaves. So everybody grab one of these. Take one, pass it around. Miner's lettuce is one of the tastiest wild edibles. This tastes like butterhead lettuce. And it also has lots of vitamin C in it. We used to do trade shows like health fairs and book conventions. And so at one of these fairs, our neighbor in the, in the booth next to us, 
he got on this high horse where he's like, I'm going to make Sergey eat some supplements. And I have nothing against supplements other than that they try and sell them to people through fear-based tactics. So this guy would not let me alone. He's like, you need to try my supplement. You're just not getting enough nutrition in your diet. And he had some device that somehow could uh, calculate how many uh, antioxidants were in your system. And so he's, he, finally he made me a deal. He's like, I'll leave you alone if you take my test. And if I find that you're lacking in antioxidants, you have to try my supplement. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so he puts me through the test and his, his um, scale was like zero to 10,000. You know, 10,000, I forget his unit of measurement, but it's not really important. So as close to 10,000 is ideal as possible, right? When he measured me, I had 50,000. Uh -huh. So I was literally off his chart. So then he was like, okay, well, that's got to be, something <laughs> went wrong. So he tested me again, same result. He tested my mom. She had 45,000. My dad had the most. He had 70. And, and he was like, okay, wait, what do you guys do again? <laughs> so then he was like, okay, I'm, I'm prepared to listen. So miner's lettuce is really rich in antioxidants. It's, it's good to get as much as we can in our diet and this will do it as well as all of the greens that we've been talking about. And so we've already identified that it grows in a basil rosette. The key tell of miner's lettuce is the disc shaped leaves and then the stem goes directly through the middle of the leaf. It's a satellite dish. It's a satellite dish. Yeah, it's like a deep, 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 deep. <laughs> pop quiz. How do you identify a true dandelion? Smooth vein. Smooth vein. How do, I, how do you identify a miner's lettuce leaf? Looks like a satellite dish. That's the right, the right answer. It has a disc leaf and then the stem goes directly through the leaf. How would I eat this? This is a great plant to eat raw. It, it's kind of like spinach. If you try and cook it, you need to get like pounds of it. And then when you cook it down, it's going to go whoop. So, more, more often than not, I would just eat it raw in a salad. It's really delicious. You don't, almost don't need to do anything to it. It tastes great. And the reason they look so puny and pathetic here is because this plant likes shade. So it usually grows under trees, on hillsides. If you go to Chambers Bay, where you never want to harvest because you don't want to harvest from golf courses. But if you do the loop, you'll see that along the hillside, there's tons of miner's lettuce. And there's another variety there called Siberian miner's lettuce, which is a little bit different. On we go. Everybody grab one. In fact, actually, let's take this moment to kind of just chill for a second. I know we're getting close, but we have like maybe three or four more plants to look at. So these are wild daisies. And daisies are in the sunflower family. And a lot of sunflowers we already um, discerned are edible. There's over almost 24,000 different varieties. So these little ground daisies are really good to eat raw. In fact, actually, if you find some leaves, they're pretty hard to get to under the grass, but uh, the leaves kind of rem remind me of like arugula almost. They kind of have this slightly skunky smell to them. And so I would throw the leaves in a salad I would throw the flowers in a salad because they're beautiful, they're edible. I would again take the petals and throw them in an ice cube tray and make petal infused ice. Maybe while I was harvesting dandelion greens and flowers, I would take some of the, these daisies and mix them with the flowers and throw them in honey or maple syrup. And that way when it gets cold, cloudy and dreary in Tacoma, I would go to make a piece of toast and I would just spread some of that jam on my toast and get a little boost of vitamin D. I mean, it's literally that simple. And the other thing I wanna talk about since we're here is clover. So most lawns in the world, at this point I've been to 66 countries and I can say with confidence that in every country that I've been to, I've been able to find clover on a lawn. So most lawns have clover on them. Grab a clover leaf. Clovers are in the pea family. So they're kind of like wild peas, which is the first thing that we talked about. And peas have a lot of protein in them, and they also have B vitamins. B1, B2, B3, B6, B12. Uh, they also have phosphorus, um, I believe magnesium, manganese, and zinc. So they're very, very nutritious and delicious. You could just take this little leaf and throw it in your soup salad, cook it, 
eat it raw. I like smoothies personally because I feel like that's the easiest way to get greens in our diet. It's funny, one of my comments on my book on Amazon, some guy went through my book and counted how many times I say smoothie. And I think I say it like 250 times and he's like, I didn't realize how much this guy likes smoothies. <laughs> but the only reason I do is because it's just an easy way to get greens in our diet. You just wake up, make a smoothie for yourself and that ensures that you're gonna get at least two salads in smoothie form in your diet. So this is a great thing to do in smoothies. Let's talk about how to identify this thing. So all peas have three leaves. Unless you're lucky, then they have four. <laughs> clover has four sometimes, and we call that a four-leaf clover. Did you know that a four-leaf clover is actually more nutritious than a three-leaf clover? It's 25% more nutritious. Another identifying characteristic of clover is that the leaf has a crescent-shaped little white part on it. It's beautiful, right? Okay, now take the leaf really close and personal and look at the edges and tell me what you see. It's jagged. It almost looks like it has tiny little spines on it. Those are great identifying characteristics. It's literally that easy. You just, right now what you're doing is you're building your search image of clover. We're spending time with these plants intimately and you don't even realize maybe fully right now what you're doing, but later on you go home or in a month and a year, you're gonna be sitting in a park with your friends having a picnic and your hand is gonna wander because you get a little bored and you're gonna pick up a clover and you're gonna be like, huh, three leaves, oval, clover. And that means I did my job somewhat correctly. Okay, on we go. A few more and then we're going to head home, answer some questions and anybody that needs to go can go. What kind of tree is this? How do we know? Long needles. Long needles. A fun fact about pines, uh, this, is, this ruined my surprise. So another way to identify pines is they always either have two or five needles. So they're going to be long and then they're either going to have two or five needles. And again, you can make tea from these needles, uh, just boil these down. But what I'm here to look at today is this. That's pine pollen. So if you're allergic to pollen, probably not the best edible for you. But if you're not allergic to pollen, this is pure protein. This is amino acids. So how you would harvest this is you put a plastic bag over this and you just shake. Or you can literally just take these and just eat them or throw them in a smoothie or a soup. You know, if you're making like some pizza, you could put some of that in the dough, get creative. And that stuff's really nutritious. Uh, the other thing I want to show you while you're here is this plant that grows underneath it. Uh, let's all grab one of these. We'll get some more. Grab one, pass it around. Okay, this is another one of those plants that uh, we can identify much easier by smell than sight. So crush this up and tell me what this smells like. So this is called yarrow. And yarrow develops a very big like umbrella-like flower in late summer. Sometimes it's white, sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it's pink. And yarrow is another sleep aid. So if you have problems with insomnia, uh, if you just have trouble falling asleep at night, you could take some of that wild chamomile that we learned about. You could take some of those daisies and you could take some yarrow, which smells very sweet, almost makes you salivate. You could dry it, put it in a tea, and now you have a foraged sleep aid. Pretty cool, huh? The other thing that's uh, nice about yarrow is if you ever cut yourself and you're in the woods, you can literally press this into your wound because it has antiseptic, antibacterial properties. Um, in fact, Vikings used to use this. They would actually fill their wounds with it when they got battle wounds. Uh, Native Americans did similar stuff. Um, one time when I was on the trail, I cut through my palm while trying to cut a uh, piece of fruit that we had in our backpack. And obviously I was 50 miles away from a hospital, so there was no way I, that I could stitch it up. 
But what I actually took is uh, rose petals because they're natural bandages. And then I would alternate that with yarrow. And you can look at my palm later, but there's almost no scar. It's sealed up really nicely. Wild edibles can literally save your life sometimes. And this is another one of those. What kind of tree is this? What kind of tree is this? How do we know? Flat needles, it's a fir. Okay, on we go. Boys and girls, what kind of tree is this? How do we know? Okay, who thinks spruce? Raise your hand. Who thinks fir? Okay, you're right, it's a fir. Okay, on this one, let's also point out the bright little green tips. Who was talking about those early? You were. So these are awesome eaten. These are like the springtime green tips and they taste like lemon, yeah. So these parts, you throw straight into salads. They concentrate vitamin C. They're good for your respiratory. They get phlegm out of your system. You can pickle them. So in the springtime, now I'd come through here with a little bowl and I'd just start taking them. And before long, I'd have enough to really make a meal of, you know? You can also use these in tea but they're not quite, th these are the meristematic bits of the fur. So they're not going to be as fragrant. I think for tea, you use the more mature ones. And then for eating for salads, you use the more nutritious, more delicious bits, which is the meristematic bits. Okay, what kind of tree is this? Who said spruce? I'm going to pick on you. Come over here. Grab a needle. And this is actually a good example. So the last pine had two needles. This pine has five needles. Count them up. Well, this will be the last one right here. I don't know. Yeah, right. Nope. Don't believe it. Oh, sweet. Okay, take a leaf. Pass it around. Here, we'll, we'll do this. Fuzzy. Take one, pass it around. Take one, pass it around. First, we're going to do the test. You flip it over. Is this a dandelion? Probably not. If it's smooth. No, that's smooth. It looks like it. It looks like it, yes. Yeah, so I thought it was a dandelion. How do we know that it's not a dandelion? It's herring. Good job. So this, in fact, is not a dandelion. It's, it's a dandelion relative. And this is called cat's ears, probably because it kind of looks like a little cat ear. It's perfectly edible. It has similar properties to a dandelion, which is uh, that it's good for your inner organs, your gallbladder, pancreas, liver, kidneys. Because it's fuzzy, this one is a better green to eat cooked. It's much more pleasant. So again, you throw it in soups and pastas. Uh, stir fries, this is a great green for stir fries. Um, how else? You could bake it, you could put it in lasagna, you could do whatever the heck you want with it, but this is a great green and it's literally everywhere in Tacoma. The other identifying characteristic is it will develop yellow flowers, kind of like a dandelion, but a dandelion has one flower per stem and cat's ears will have multiple yellow flowers per stem. Okay, so I promise this will be the last one. This will be the last one. Let's head back to expand. Uh, if anybody wants to buy a book, I have a couple of those. Otherwise, I'll answer questions. And if people need to go, they can go or we can kind of linger for a little bit and talk more about plants.